Okay, so um, I'm, I'm kind of chained to the computer because I lost my, my clicker, so I can't move and, and, and do my PowerPoint at the same time. i got to do it from the computer. Um, the title, if you want to give it a title, is um, The Gospel and Acts as History. We're going to zoom in on the, specifically the four Gospels and the Book of Acts and look at them as they relate to history. Because a lot of people want to take the Bible and put it over here in a separate category of religious text. Oh, well, that's superstition. That's religion. That's not real history. That's just that holy book you have. But according to historians for quite most of the last 2,000 years, and according to the Bible itself, these are the record of events. It's actual historical documents. I've had people ask me before, well, what historical document do you have? I'm like, I have this one right here. The Bible, that, that's a historical document. These are documents from history. The question is, are they reliable? And that's what we're going to try to answer tonight. Um, just by way of full disclosure, I stole this presentation from uh, Dr. Tim McGrew. Real great guy, does a lot of good work. Um, there's been several things that we've talked about here that I have stolen from him. When we talked about undesigned coincidences, those little tidbits of trivia in the Gospels that all kind of fit together like puzzle pieces to give you the full picture. Uh, whenever we talked about who the actual authors of the Bible are and how we know from history that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John really did write those books, um, I got a lot of that material from Dr. McGrew. Um, and he has a website. I told him if he's given me permission, I'll go ahead and plug his website. He has a website called the Library of Historical Apologetics. Where he takes um, a bunch of books, just tons and tons and tons of books from old dead guys that nobody ever reads anymore. And so as we engage in conversations about religion, about the Bible, about Christianity, um, in our culture today, people are bringing up questions that people 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago were already wrestling with and came up with answers for. But the problem is nobody's reading those books anymore. And so he has been finding these books and scanning them in. Uh, you can go on the website and download them in PDF format and, and read just like, like old theologians and things that nobody seems to be aware of or read anymore. So lots of good stuff there. So that's me plugging Dr. McGrew because he's letting me use his stuff. Good job. Okay. To start us off, it's always good to remember that this is historical documents. Uh, Luke, in his gospel, makes it very, very clear his intention. He's writing to, uh, he says, he, he names him Theophilus. We don't know if that was a specific individual's name or a group or just a general, hey, because it means lover of God. So whoever he's writing to, this is what he says. It seemed good to me, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you might have certainty concerning the things that you have been taught. Okay, that certainty. Hey, I'm writing you these things so that you can know it's true. You can know it's a fact. You can be certain. Some people like to argue that it's all probability. Well, maybe it happened. You can kind of be mostly sure, and so you're safe to believe. No, no, no. Certainty, that you can stand firm on the knowledge that what is presented in the Bible is indeed fact, that it is certain. So we're going to talk about historical reliability. This is, this is really funny. This lets you know how philosophers think. This is Dr. McGrew's definition. Historical reliability, the non-technical definition. A document is historically reliable if the fact that it makes a claim about a factual matter generally affords a significant prima facie reason to accept the claim, at least in broad outline. You all get that? That's the non-technical definition. Basically, what that means um, is that we're... Uh, if a document is historically reliable, um, you can just you can pretty much trust what it says unless you have reason from some other source pointing out and telling you, um, hey, wait, they may have gotten that one wrong. So the Bible can be established to be a historical document, reliable, um, just as any other historical document. That if you pick it up and read it, what you read, you can take it face value as being true, short of anything else proving it wrong. 
which, as we'll see a little bit in the case of the Bible, the more people try, the more people fail. Um, one thing, the talk today is not about the Bible being infallible or inerrant. Um, I believe it is those things, but that's not the focus of this. We're just talking about it as historical documents. If we were just um, non-religious, if we were just, just approaching the Bible as not a holy book, but as historical documents, would they be reliable by those standards? And I think that they are. And so if we're going to claim that, obviously we're going to need some ways to establish that this is the case. And so there's a few ways you could do that. If you want to know if a document is reliable, well, you could know about the author. Is the author trustworthy? Is he someone who was there, who saw the events, who doesn't have a reason to lie? You know, those sorts of things. Okay, well, maybe we can trust him. And we can establish that stuff to some degree with the um, authors of the Bible. Uh, but when you get into documents that old, this might get a little bit of a fuzzy area. And so what we're going to look at is you get multiple points of contact. So you have the Bible, and then you have these other historical records. And you go, okay, where these things intersect, how does the Bible match up? Does the Bible actually get confirmed? Does it kind of fall in line with, especially does it kind of interweave and interlock with these other um, historical sources? And if that can be proven, then um, we're doing pretty good. And so, um, da -da -da. external evidence, the possibilities. So here's how we're going to do this. Whenever you look at a piece of um, historical evidence, you take the Bible and you take this other historical source and you put them up side by side, there's really basically three categories, three things that can happen. Either one, it's going to confirm. They're going to match. The Bible says this. This other source says this. They confirm. Now, there's also the possibility that there's going to be a contradiction. Well, the Bible says this. Oh, but this other source says that. Okay, now there's some tension. Now there's a problem. So what are you going to do with that? Or maybe the Bible says this, and this other historical record says nothing. Got nothing to say about it whatsoever. And so those are kind of the three things that we're going to be dealing with. as we, We're going to go through some stuff as we check this out. And here are the three claims I'm going to put forward to you and then try to prove through this presentation. One, there are numerous lots of multiple places where the Bible intersects with and can be confirmed by these other historical documents that we have. That secular, atheist, agnostic, whatever you want to call them, any other historian in the world is going to look at these other documents and say, these are trustworthy. These are reliable. This is what we believe happened. We're going to take the Bible and we're going to say, okay, when you match those up, they match. It confirms the Bible. And we're going to take a look at some contradictions, where people say, wait a minute, the Bible says this, but these other sources say that, uh-oh. We're going to look and say, well, actually, maybe those contradictions aren't as contradictory as people think. Then we're going to take a look at the fact that we don't hear something does not mean nothing happened. It's called an argument from silence. It's actually a logical fallacy. It's bad reasoning to argue from silence. If you have no information, all that means is you have no information. You can't actually say, we don't have a record, therefore that didn't happen. That's actually not a good way to argue. So I hope that you came thirsty because um, this is probably about what's going to happen. Is this going to work? There we go. There you go. Hope you're thirsty. That's what we're about to have. We're about to be drinking from a fire hose. I'm about to unload on you. Um, so I'm going to be recording it. So if you get done and you're just like, what did he say? I think he was right. Wow. Okay. That I'm overwhelmed. You can go back and listen again. Um, but I'm going to be drinking from the fire hose tonight. So y'all ready? Am I comfortable? No, not comfortable. I'm sorry. There's nothing I can do about that. Fight through it anyway. We've got both ACs working now. Hopefully that temperature's dropping. Right. Um, okay. One of the main things we have to keep in mind whenever we're looking at ancient historical information, documents, whenever we have a historian write something, we have to ask ourselves, how do they know? How would they know that information? 
And how would you know? Let's say you're writing a book about something that happened um, even fairly recently, maybe within the last 20, 30 years. Where are you going to get your information? Well, depending on um, how old you are, maybe you'll go to Wikipedia, right? Everything's on Wikipedia. You want to learn about something, you just go to Wikipedia. Bam, it'll tell you about just about anything. But anyone will tell you that may not be that reliable. People can edit that and change things. So, okay, not Wikipedia, but everything's on the Internet. So let's just go to Google. Right? We want to find something out. We go check it out on Google. But how do you sort through the stuff on Google? I know I can trust my friends and family. So let's hit up Facebook and Twitter and ask some questions. Hey, guys, what do you all think about this? Surely they will know. Well, that's not really a good way to do it. Plus, you don't really like to read very much. Well, nowadays, just about anything is on YouTube. So if you want to know an answer, just go to YouTube and you'll find a video telling you what to think. Right? Or if you want to try to be a little more responsible, you go to one of these places that have these shelves and rows and rows of books called a library. Right? That's what we might do today. But 2,000 years ago, if you're a historian trying to write about some events, where are you getting your information? I, there's just there's, the places to get it is kind of small. First one that people accuse the Bible authors of is uh, you can make it up. People claim that's what the Bible authors did. They just made stuff up. Didn't know what they were talking about. You can actually do some research. I mean, it wasn't impossible to do research. You could go talk to people who may have been there. You can go research people who supposedly know about it. Um, you could go to a library. They did exist, but they were few and far between. And never know what books they or scrolls they may or may not have on any particular um, topic. So the best way that people would know about things is they actually experienced it. They had first-hand knowledge of an event. Or they got the information from an eyewitness. Right? And, and so the way that you might have to go study it back then. And so as we consider, hey, what did these people know back then? Well, we have to stop and think, well, if they knew it, they actually had to go through some effort to learn it, right? And so with that in mind, keeping in mind that they couldn't just get on and Google it, they couldn't just go run down to their city library that has, you know, 5,000 books on the shelves and, you know, another thousands of books available through exchange programs and online and whatever. No, no, no. They, they actually had to go do the legwork to learn things. Okay. External confirmation. Oh, this is what's really neat. We know a lot about first century Israel. We, we actually do. There's actually quite a bit of what was going on there in the politics. We have a historian, his name is Josephus, we'll talk about him here in a second, who gives us a ton of good information. The, we know the political situation was very complicated, that they had this double system in place. See, when the Jews got conquered by the Romans, they didn't get conquered through military invasion. They basically just said, hey, We'll join you. And so they, they kind of were taken over in this way where they got to preserve some of their cultural identity and some of their personal kind of ways of doing things. They got a little bit of um, autonomous control within their own borders. right? And so you had um, Roman taxes. They had Jewish taxes. You had the Roman military. Well, you also had the Jewish military. right? You, you had um, Roman courts. But you also had Jewish courts. And so you just kind of had this double system in place. Then we'll see this getting played out throughout the New Testament because the Bible authors actually get it right. And what we have going on during this time of the life of Jesus and shortly after is a very complicated um, kind of back and forth interplay of power and politics in the area. We start out at the time that Jesus is born in 6 B.C., um, the monk who originally calculated that got it wrong. Jesus was actually born in 6 B.C. Um, Herod, Herod the Great, the king, he dies in 4 B.C. He actually ruled the entirety of Israel and some other areas around there. He, he, he ruled the whole enchilada. Right? The, the whole thing was under his control. Well, whenever he dies, he actually splits it up among his sons, and it becomes um, several little provinces, or tetrarchs is the actual word, and you have um, Archelaus in the, down in Judea, Antipas up in the north, and a couple other. He had some kids, so he had several of these little groupings where they ruled. So you start out with one big kingdom, then it breaks into a bunch of little territories. 
And then, after Archelaus dies, Rome comes in and takes over Judea. Judea is the big, that's where Jerusalem is. That's the big, important place. So Rome takes it over, but up in the north in Galilee and some other places are still under these little regional kings. Okay? But then, after a while, um, Herod's grandson actually gets to become king again. Rome grants him the authority, and he gets the whole of his grandfather's kingdom back for a few years. And then once he dies, the entire area is taken over by Rome, finally, once and for all, none of these little um, local leaders or rulers. Rome just takes it over. And all of that happening within a span of about 40 or 50 years. This is a lot of political interchange and a lot of complicated, chaotic things going on, but the Bible gets it right. Every time there's something going on through this timeline, when the Bible mentions it, the Bible gets it right. You have in, um, the, when it's a single kingdom under Herod, in Matthew 2, 1, it mentions that Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king in 6 BC. So we have, whenever Jesus is born, they mention Herod is king. Guess who's king when Jesus is born? Herod. We know this from non-biblical sources. The Bible's matching up. Then you have um, this area where there's all these different principalities and other native leaders. In Matthew 2, Joseph and Mary with baby Jesus on the way back from Egypt. It says, Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod. Well, guess what? At the time that would have been happening, that's what we see. So the Bible, again, is matching what we know of the politics of the day. Then it turns into a country that's kind of ruled by Rome in the south, but then ruled by other people in other areas. Um, Luke 3.1 mentions that Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea. Herod, this was Herod Antipas, this is who this is referring to, is tetrarch in Galilee. His brother Philip, tetrarch in the region of uh, Iturea, Trachonitis, and Licinius, tetrarch of Abilene. So here again you have the Bible confirming Roman control in Judea and these other regional local governors up in other areas. King Agrippa, right? We have this kingdom all united under one native king ruling the whole land. Acts 12 mentions this, uh, at the time of King Herod laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. So in the early days of the church, hey, there's a suddenly a king again. Oh, wait, look. Whenever we um, put it on the timeline. Yeah, there's this little bit of strip of time, about three years when Agrippa, the grandson of Herod the Great, rules his grandfather's kingdom for just a few years. And then whenever we see Paul on um, trial, he's on trial before some Roman governors, um, Felix and Festus, there in Acts 27 and 28, and that takes place right at that same time. So from secular historical records, from non-biblical historical records, we know this was a very chaotic political time for the region, back and forth between different governors and different controlling rulers, and the Bible gets it right every single time. That just shows that the Bible authors knew something about what they were writing. How easy would it be for them to kind of forget or mistake if they're writing 30, 40, 50, 60 years after the events, and they weren't actually there, as some people claim, that they're going to remember when exactly events happened and who was ruling at the time and where. They get it right every step along the way. Now, and we're going to run through these kind of quick. I'm going to run through these kind of quick. Like I said, he took about almost two hours for his presentation. I'm trying to cram this into an hour. So buckle up. Here we go. Eight different points where the Bible is confirmed by historical records. We're going to draw a lot on this guy, Josephus. He was a Jew who was born about the time that the apostle Paul converted. So he's kind of um, contemporary to the events. He, was, he would have been a kid during the days of the early church. But then whenever Rome came in and conquered, um, destroyed the temple, had a little war going on there in 70 AD when that was put to rest, he kind of fell in favor with the Romans. Um, he kind of helped them out. He became a translator for the Romans. And one favor ended up getting taken to Rome where he was given lands and uh, scholars and scribes to study under him and help him with his historical studies. Uh, but he gives us a lot of information about the, the time of Jesus, about the things that are going on 
in that area of the world at that time. And he has no loyalty to Christianity. He's a Jew, and he's a Roman. So there's no reason we should think there's any kind of bias. He, he certainly is not trying to make things look good for the Christians. And so let's look at some things in the Bible. There's this interesting detour whenever Joseph and Mary and Jesus are coming back from Egypt. It says in Matthew 2.22, when Joseph heard that Archelaus was ruining, ugh, <clears throat> easy for me to say, Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. Now that's kind of a strange thing to say because it's only natural that the son is going to take over the reign of his father. So, so when Herod dies, his son takes over. There's nothing. Why would that be something he would need to turn away about? Well, we find out from Josephus that when Herod the Great died, um, Archelaus barely even taken over. I mean, he, he's, we're, we're talking within months. He hadn't even gotten officially recognized yet as the official ruler by Rome. Um, and the Jews are having their feast of the Passover, and so um, he has this little bit of skirmish that goes on. So the Passover's coming up, and according to Josephus, possibly millions of Jews would be in Jerusalem for the Passover. Even if that's exaggerated, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of people in town at that time. And what ends up happening is... Um, I'm not going to get into the backstory, but there's some bad blood going on between the Jews and the Romans, and some pilgrims coming in, um, they get in a little fight with some Roman soldiers and stone them, and most of the Roman soldiers die. And then the Jews pick up their sacrifices, run into the temple, and hide in the crowds. Well, Archelaus finds out about this, and he kind of flips out, goes into panic mode, um, because if this kind of thing gets back and he doesn't deal with it right and squash that kind of activity, Rome could squash him. And so he has soldiers go and seal off the temple. Don't let anyone in. Don't let anyone out. We're going to deal with this. And then he sends soldiers in and kills 3,000 Jews in the temple. Passover got canceled. Right? The, the, the temple had been def, uh, profaned. It had been um, sullied. It was now unclean with the blood of murder victims. It had to be cleaned. The Passover was done. So pilgrims now are leaving Jerusalem and going back home. Well, they're leaving. Guess who's coming up from Egypt heading towards Jerusalem? Mary and Joseph with little baby Jesus. So do you think maybe the people on the road were talking about something that had gone on? Right? As he's going to Jerusalem, he's seeing people coming back. Hey, where are you going? Isn't it Passover? Oh, well, you haven't heard about what Archelaus did. So now Joseph recognizes he is as bad as his father. I don't want to go there. Let's go up north to Galilee because Herod Antipas is ruling in Galilee and he's not the bloodthirsty monster his brother is. So now that kind of makes a little sense for the events of the Bible and the other historical sources fall right in line with one another. <clears throat> Pilate's wife. Pilate's wife. I love this. In Matthew 27... Um, Pilate has, is, he's trying as hard as he can to let Jesus go. He knows the man is innocent. He's done nothing wrong, but the Jews are so insistent. And so he's trying to find a way to get through this, and he gets this. Matthew 27, 19. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him in a dream. So he's in this situation, and he gets a message from a wife that says, I had a dream Leave that man alone. Have nothing to do with this whole situation. It's not going to be good. Well, people have tried to say that that didn't actually happen. That Matthew wrote that in there is kind of a special little, ooh, look, you know, God was sending a vision to Pilate's wife. And then critics say, but wait a minute. Pilate's wife wouldn't even have been there. Caesar Augustus, who was the king or the Caesar, the emperor of Rome, when Jesus was born, he had made a rule that his governors could not take their wives with them. So whenever Pilate would have gone to Judea, he is not supposed to, the, the rule of um, Caesar Augustus was, your wife has to stay in Rome. And so critics will say 
that uh, this is made up. Christians just made this up. The author of Matthew has no idea what he's talking about, just made it right up. Pilate's wife would not have been there. Well, but then we have this guy, Cornelius Tacitus. He's a Roman governor, and he actually uh, is also a historian. And he has studied and found out that um, during the reign of uh, Tiberius, who's the Caesar after Augustus, that during his reign, this rule kind of got, you know, let go. People could bring their wives. No one ever really cared. Actually, at one point, he records that someone put forth in the Senate to pass a law to make this rule get enforced again, and it didn't get passed. So people say, well, Augustus passed a rule. Pilate wouldn't have had his wife with him. Well, but Tacitus lets us know no one actually followed that rule. They brought their wives with them. So there we have the Bible matching up with the historical accounts yet again. This one is fun. Going from Tyre to Galilee. Right? This is, we're going to test your, your uh, geography if you were paying attention a few weeks ago. Mark 7, 31. Then Jesus returned from the region of Tyre, and he went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. Well, if you know your geography, there's a little bit of a problem here. Because I don't know, Tyre is right up there by where the underlining is there, and Sidon is north of it. So Jesus went north to get to the Sea of Galilee. Well, that just seems really weird. That'd be like saying, hey, I'm going to go to Dallas to get to Houston. Well, that doesn't make any sense. Why would you do that? And so critics have said clearly to them, hold on, where, where, where am I not working? Where am I? There we go. See that? They say that's the path he should have taken, just straight down there to it from Tyre. Critics have written, this is uh, Adam Wynn, who is uh, in his book, The Purpose of Mark's Gospel. He says, many interpreters have noted this awkward route as evidence that Mark was unfamiliar with the geography of Palestine and Galilee. Well, but here's the deal. Here's a physical map. You see the dark colors there? Those represent elevation. I don't know if you can see what is right there between uh, Tyre and the Sea of Galilee. Let me put them side by side. If you're trying to go from Tyre down to the Sea of Galilee, what's right there in your way? A mountain. The elevation of that mountain is actually, um, that says 1208. That's in meters. So if you do the math, we're coming up with Mount Moran, elevation almost 4,000 feet. This is the view. If you're standing I mean, this was taken. Nowadays, if you're standing in where the city of Tyre is, Tyre, 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 I don't know how to pronounce that, Tyre, and you're standing there looking east, this is what you see. So if he was to try to go straight from there to the Sea of Galilee, he would have to go over that mountain. But what's happening there to the left of the screen? It's kind of dipping down, losing elevation. Well, that's because up near Sidon, there's actually a pass where you can go from Sidon through that pass between the mountains and follow the River Jordan all the way down to the Sea of Galilee. Well, hey, now not only do you have to go over a mountain, you've got water for your trip. And if you've been to the Holy Land, you know you're going to want some water while you're traveling. And so, once again, authors of the Bible matching up with what we can know. Jewish law. Apparently, Mark has no idea what he's talking about when it comes to Jewish law. Because Jesus, talking about marriage and divorce, answering a question someone posed, he said, if she divorces her husband, if a woman divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. And we think, well, yeah, you know, woman divorces, committing adultery. Well, here's the deal. In Jewish law, the book of Moses, there is no uh, allowance for the wife to file for divorce. You look in the law in the Old Testament, the husband can divorce, wives can't. And so people have said, aha, here we go. Mark was just a Gentile, he was not a Jew, and here he is showing his ignorance of Jewish law. Here is the words of one critic, it says that this sentence is generally regarded as an addition to Jesus' teaching that was made to address situations related to Roman legal practice whereby a woman could initiate divorce. 
So people are saying, oh, well, Mark, you know, he was a, he was a Gentile. He didn't know Jewish law. He just kind of added that in to kind of help it make sense to the Romans. Well, but if you know anything about what's going on at the time, Josephus tells us that Herodias, who was um, the wife of Herod Antipas, that Herodias took it upon herself to confound the laws of our country and divorced her first husband in order to marry Herod Antipas. So she wanted to marry the king, but she was already married. So she did what was not lawful to do and divorced her first husband in order to marry Herod. Now here's the thing. Herod rules over what area? Galilee. Where's Jesus standing whenever he says this? Galilee. So this is actually commentary on current events. So whenever Jesus was standing there saying, when a woman divorces her husband, she commits adultery. Ooh, they would have known exactly who he was talking about. And so, definitely, again, the Bible lining up with history. Now we have this one, uh, Luke 3.14. There's some soldiers who asked Jesus, uh, and we, what shall we do? They're wanting to follow Jesus. They're hearing his teachings, and they want to follow. Well, what are we going to do? And he said to them, do not extort money from anyone by threats or by false accusation, and be content with your wages. What's interesting is, doesn't make sense to us. When you get into the Greek, when it says some soldiers asked him, the, the, in the Greek, the grammar is a little different. And it actually is saying um, soldiering, that they were soldiering, that they were doing so, they were actively on duty, that these guys were active military on mission whenever they encountered Jesus. Well, here's the thing. It's a time of peace. They're not at war with anybody. Right? There, there, there's no, Rome isn't fighting any battles. Who are these soldiers, and why are they soldiering? Why are they active-duty military in a time of peace? Well, Herod, in order to marry Herodias, he divorced his first wife. And the problem there is his first wife had a daddy who was a king of a neighboring region. And so whenever she got divorced, she went running home to daddy, and daddy wasn't too happy about it. So there was some little border wars going on. It wasn't a Roman war. There wasn't a big war, but it was some military stuff back and forth between Herod and this guy because of him divorcing her. And so Herod's soldiers would have been on duty. This guy's kingdom was actually a little, a little south, a little is to the east, a little, uh, well, I guess on your side it would be this. It's, it's down a little like around the Sea of Galilee, a little more to the south. And so he would have been sending soldiers south along the Jordan to the Sea of Galilee, down there to where he had a fortress, where that's where the showdowns would have been going on. So these guys were actual soldiers in active duty because there was a little war going on. It wasn't a Roman war. It was a little infighting between territories. But we find out once again, the Bible knows what it's talking about. This one's fun. This is, the, this is where Jesus kind of um, turns the tables on him when it comes to taxes. Right in Luke 20, 24 and 25, they say, hey, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar? And they think they've got it. Because if he says, yes, pay your taxes, well, then everybody's going to flip out and get mad because they don't like the Romans. If he says, no, don't pay your taxes, then all they have to do is go, Romans, he's telling people not to pay their taxes. Right? So they think they've got him in a pickle. But he says this, goes, show me a denarius, show me a Roman coin whose likeness and whose inscription does it have? And they say, Caesar's. And he says, well, then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. Well, that's a neat little story in and of itself, except for the fact that we've actually found some of these coins. And whose image is on there? Caesar's, right? Not just his crest, not just his symbol. Caesar himself is image on there. Well, there's a little problem with Jews and images. Uh, Exodus 20, verse 4, You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. Think that kind of qualifies as being in the earth beneath? Hey, have no images, no carved images of things. But then he says, whose inscription is that? And you think, okay, well, no big deal. It just has Caesar's name on it. No, no, no. 
the inscription, I'm not going to try to read the Latin, the inscription translates roughly to Augustus Tiberius Caesar, son of the divine Augustus. This would have been a reference to the Roman worship of their emperor. Think that might have a little problem with the Jews? Exodus 20, verse 3, you shall have no other gods before me. So they're saying to him, oh yeah, do we have to pay taxes? He goes, oh, you're worrying about taxes? Show me the coin. And he holds it up. Whose image? Whose inscription? And right then and there, one of the reasons why they suddenly were staring down at their sandal straps is because he just shamed them because that right there violates two of the Ten Commandments. The first two. All right, woman at the well. This one's kind of fun. We know the story. Jesus coming through Samaria stops. Uh, there, uh, you know, disciples go on in to find some food, and he's sitting there. A lady comes to draw some water, and he basically says, hey, you know, go get your husband, and exposes that she doesn't have a husband, says, of course you don't have a husband. You've been married five times, and the guy you're shacking up with now, he's not your husband anyway. And she says, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. And then she turns it religious. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where the people ought to worship. And Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You, here's the point. You worship what you don't know. We worship what we know. For salvation is of the Jews. And that's an interesting little statement. You don't even know what you worship. Well, we find out from Josephus that a couple centuries before, the Samaritans had actually kind of been a little bit of a problem because the Romans were coming down. There was a little bit of an uprising of the Jews. And the Roman governor up in Syria was coming down to hammer the Jews to put down their little uprising. And the Samaritans, scared that they were going to get caught in the middle and that the, the, Samar the uh, Syrians were going to think that they were Jews and they are like, hey, hey, Let's send word to this guy. And so Antiochus IV was his name. Let's send word to Antiochus. And they, and they basically said, hey, hey, we're not Jews. I mean, we keep the Sabbath. You know, we got a few little cultural things. But hey, we're not Jews. Um, we, we have our own temple, completely different temple. And if you would just leave us alone, we will actually dedicate our temple to you. And Antiochus was under the impression, or at least put out the persona, that he was Zeus incarnated. Right? And so they, okay, we're going to make our temple a temple to Zeus. And so whenever she says to Jesus, hey, where are we supposed to worship? You say Jerusalem, we say here. And he goes, you don't even know what you worship. You dedicated your temple to Zeus. You're, you're asking where you're supposed to worship Yahweh? Your temple says Zeus. You don't even know who you worship. And so there again, historical record lining up with the Bible. Um, da, 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 da. Okay, I think this is maybe the last one. Pool of Bethesda, right? We all know the story. Jesus comes up. There's a guy laying there, says, hey, I want to get well. But, you know, the angel comes, stirs the water. First person in the water gets healed. But I can't get in the water because I'm just laying here. Um, it says, in Jerusalem, by the Sheep Gate, there's a pool in Aramaic, which is called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. Well, here's the problem. For the longest time, we couldn't find a pool in Jerusalem with five roofed colonnades. And people took this and twisted it to a metaphor. Here's one commentator saying that the agents hope, ancients hoped to find a source of a Jewish symbol and in the five porches an allusion to the five books of the law. And so what the message would be is they would say that the, the five porches, the five coverings, actually represented the five books of the law. And here's this poor man who's under the law and nothing can help him, but Jesus can help him. And so they turn it into a metaphor. And that might be a good point, but the fact is there actually is a pool. They discovered it. Archaeological work in 1956 uncovered a pool near the Sheep Gate that had five porches. Four, one on each side and one across the middle. Oh, looky there, the Bible knew what it was talking about. We actually have, uh, there it is. It's a picture of the archaeological site. Um, I'm going to skip the book of Acts. The amount of information that we have 
about confirmed in the book of Acts is amazing. It gets ports, it gets um, locations of cities, uh, landmarks, shipping lanes, uh, names, a specific language. There's a village that has its own unique language, and the Bible gets it right. You have uh, areas of um, centers of industry, and the Bible nails it, what that city actually did. Um, descriptions of different things. What I think is really fun is um, accuracy of titles, right? All these different places, when it mentions a ruler in a particular city or country or region, all these different little places have their own different little governments and different little titles for their rulers and for their kings and their governors and their procurators and their proconsuls. And the Bible gets it right every time in every location. And so um, some alleged historical errors. Okay, so we just saw a whole mess of examples where the history confirms the Bible. Now we're going to take a look at... Um, an example where people say it contradicts the Bible. And this might get a little technical. Hang in there with me. We got the swine, right? Jesus casting out some demons. They said, no, 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 don't cast us out. Cast us in the pigs. And uh, please, you know, don't cast us away. So he goes, you know, go into the pigs. And they run down a steep hill and into the sea. Problem with that is, here in Mark 5, it says, they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes, and the herd numbering about 2,000 rushed down the steep bank to the sea and were drowned in the sea. The problem we run into is Gerasa, the land of the Gerasenes, is nowhere near the Sea of Galilee. It's about 37 miles to the south, and people say, well, Mark just blundered, right? A little arrow there. There's Gerasa down there, and up there is the Sea of Galilee. Those pigs had a long way to go to get in that water. So people say, aha, Mark didn't know what he was talking about. Hold that thought. Because people often make blunders when it comes to locations. In Mark 11, it says, when Jesus drew near to Jerusalem to Bethage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples onward, and it goes on. People say, aha, look at there, Bethage and Bethany. Mark gives the wrong order. They say, because if you're coming up to Jerusalem, you're going to come to Bethany first, not Bethage. But Mark got the order backwards, showing that Mark had no idea what he was talking about. He doesn't know the area. He's not even from there, probably never even been there. That's what people say. Well, here's the thing. Look at what it says. They drew near to Jerusalem to Bethage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives. Do you see a reference to order? It's not actually saying where he went when first. This is not a travel itinerary. It's just saying over there by Bethage and Bethany. And if you go to there, those two towns are actually about half a mile away from each other. So it'd be kind of the same way that people around here talk about Bruce Valetti or Rosebud Light. You know, two, two towns that are really close to each other and just kind of get mentioned together a lot. So he's not actually talking about a came to this one, then to this one. He just says... The pair of those two towns, pointing out the area. All right, back to the pigs, because Matthew talks about the pigs, too. Matthew says, when they came to the other side, to the country of the Gadarenes, not the Gerasenes, Matthew's talking about the Gadarenes. Uh-oh, what's going on there? Because Matthew's pointing out this city up here, whenever Mark was talking about this city down here. Right? But that doesn't really help us because Gadara, that Matthew talks about, that's still seven miles away from the sea. So apparently, those pigs had a long way to run. Here's where it gets a little technical because um, you have to know a little something about the languages. There are um, lots of different variants and things, and people generally find that Matthew and Luke have the best telling, and they read Gerasene. So it's talking about Gerasene. But the way the language works, in Aramaic, it's a lot like Jewish, like Hebrew. They don't have vowels. There's different clues that tell you the vowels. They just have the consonants. And so the alliteration for this city would have been GRS or interchangeably KRS. The way we maybe exchange C or S or C or K because it's a similar sound, 
right? It's exchangeable in that language. So you could spell it either way. Okay, so you could spell it either way, but you don't have any vowels. Well, whenever you stick some vowels in there, something interesting happens. Because there is a town that's over here, right on the edge of the Sea of Galilee, whose name is Cursa, which would be K-R-S, which could easily be mistaken for G-R-S, which would have been Gerasenes. And so, actually, um, this looks like it was probably just a copying error of some kind. Someone thought they were correcting some spelling. This is actually the hill. This is the shoreline of the Sea of Galilee at Cursa. Could you see some pigs running down that hill? Right into the water? Right, there's another shot from across the lake. So, again, people look and go, aha, those Bible authors didn't know what they were talking about. Actually, what probably happened is some scribe copying misspelled something. And the two words were so close together, they got a little mixed up. You, you ever hear, you know, words getting mixed up, it happens. But whenever you actually kind of dig into it and you look at the geography and you look at the language, oh, wait a minute, there's a place that it probably was. And the, a lot of scholars think that that probably is the real place. All right. Um, we're not going to go through Luke. We're a little run out of time. Luke is really fun to get into because right there in Luke chapter 3, he lists about half a dozen different individuals that we can dig in historically and verify who they were and when they reigned and what they were doing. And so that's a lot of fun. But for time, I'm going to skip over that. Um, do, 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 lots of stuff. Da, da, da. See, all kinds of objections that people say, you know, ah, the Bible can't be right. Here's this where it contradicts history. Actually, no. Do some digging, and it doesn't contradict. But here's one thing I want to point out, just for the fun of it. Okay? This guy, Robert Price, he's a favorite historian of skeptics. Uh, they love him because he is brilliant, um, and he's able to argue really well, and he knows a lot of stuff, um, and he does not like the Bible. Here's the thing. In 2003, he wrote that there is this major collision between gospel tradition and archaeology because of this synagogue. The Bible says there's a synagogue in Capernaum. And he says there's no synagogue in Capernaum in the first century. There's no archaeological evidence showing that. 2003. Apparently he didn't do his homework because I noticed when I was looking at this, here is another historian writing how they have found a first century synagogue in Capernaum. I don't know if you can see the data when he wrote 83. So 20 years before, they already knew a synagogue had been found and excavated from the first century in Capernaum. But there's historians, popular historians, arguing no such um, synagogue existed whenever the evidence is already there. There's just a picture of the excavation. And that bottom layer there is what would have been the foundations of that earlier uh, synagogue during Jesus' time. Okay, so we have all of these different areas where the Bible is confirmed by history. Then we have these other things that are supposedly contradictions, but when you dig a little bit, they're not contradictions at all. Well, then we have things where, what about the silence? What about whatever just doesn't mention? I mean, because surely if these things happen, someone else would have been writing about them. Here's one instance people like to point out. The um, story of Herod slaughtering the babies. Whenever he hears, you know, the, remember the, the wise men come and they say, hey, well, where's the Messiah to be born? We want to come worship. And so he you know, asks his scholars and they say, Bethlehem. And so off they go to Bethlehem and Herod says, hey, come back and tell me when you find him so I can go worship him too. Well, the Magi get warned in a dream, and they go a different way and don't let Herod know what they found. Herod gets really, really mad. He's kind of worried that there's a new king in Israel because he's the king, and so he sends his soldiers to go slaughter all of the male children in Bethlehem under the age of two. Wow. Surely such a horrible, horrible thing would have been recorded by somebody, right? Well, would it? This is what people say. The way the argument goes is, if I can get my clicker right, 
that if the slaughter of the innocents had really happened, we would have other sources talking about it. We do not have other sources talking about it. Therefore, it didn't happen. Matthew just made the whole thing up. Problem is, number two is true. We don't have other sources. But does that mean that number one, I mean, really because nobody mentioned it, should we assume it didn't really happen? Here's the thing. Most of the literature that we have from that place, from that time, has a specific focus. Right? They're, they're writing for a particular reason, not just a general tell you everything that ever happened. Plus, they're usually writing to the elites, to the aristocracy, to the rulers, to the other scholars. We have to remember that Bethlehem is a village. Not that you know any number of kids being slaughtered is a horrible, terrible thing, but there really probably wasn't more than maybe about a dozen. That's not going to make national news. Um, that, that, that's not going to be something this little remote village down around um, in, in Judea, um, okay, some king who's a brutal dictator anyway, killed a few people. That's probably not going to be on the radar for people like Josephus or Pliny or Tacitus. It's just not where, where they're looking. It's not what they're thinking about. And so it's really not that weird of a thing to think that it wouldn't get written about. It's not a major event with civic importance. There's no power transition. It doesn't involve any kind of big political goings on. And so it probably would not have gained the attention. And even if they did know about it, probably wouldn't have written about it because it's not what they typically are doing. A lot of times historians get their money because they are being um, commissioned by someone to write a history about something particular. And so you're focused in on what your um, project is. And it's probably not going to include half a dozen or so people killed down in some remote village in some fringe area of the empire that no one's paying attention to. So we actually um, should not even expect that something would be there. We also have different things where events that you would think people would write about. Josephus and Philo, another historian, uh, they both just kind of pass right by that the Jews are expelled from Rome by Claudius. Right? So the emperor Claudius um, kicks the Jews out, just kicks all the Jews, runs all the Jews out of the city. There's a second century historian, Suetonius, who talks about this. No one questions whether or not this event happened. All historians will agree that Claudius kicked the Jews out of Rome. But neither Josephus nor Philo mention it. Why don't they mention it? Wouldn't their silence mean this didn't happen? No. No, it doesn't. Doesn't at all. And so historians understand that they're not just trying to write and cover everything. Not everything is getting covered by every historian who writes. Um, da 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 no first century source that we possess reports on the destruction of Herculaneum and Pompeii when Mount Vesuvius erupted. Right? Entire cities wiped out. Not recorded. Well, surely the historians would have recorded some cities being wiped out by a volcano. Nope. Didn't write anything about it. So just the fact that nothing is mentioned is not an argument. Okay. In summary, there are numerous points of contact where the Bible is confirmed by the historical evidence. A lot of the alleged contradictions, once you start digging, are not contradictions at all. And when we find silence from sources outside of the Bible, we should actually kind of expect it. You, you realize that not everything was getting written about, and even the things that were written they're written on parchment, papyri. That doesn't last. You're getting a few hundred years out of a, a scroll, typically, before it starts to wear out and fade and fall apart. That's why the Bible keeps getting copied so many times throughout the centuries, because it, I mean, it just starts to fall apart after a while. You actually should not expect that things are going to survive. They're written on very um, fragile you know, paper and parchment and that sort of things. So one, we shouldn't even expect. We actually know of a bunch of sources from that time existed, but we don't actually have them. We don't have a copy of them. 
So say, for instance, we'll get uh, Josephus, we'll refer to a writing by so-and-so. Well, we know that writing existed. Josephus talked about it. We don't have it. It's gone, lost to the sands of time. Literally, probably, you know, eaten up by the wind and the sand and just wear out. And it's just lost, gone. So just because we have silence doesn't mean that uh, we have nothing. All right. So if we're going to form our judgments about the Bible based on the publicly available evidence that we can look at from history, then we should conclude that the Gospels and the book of Acts are reliable. That as you look at them, you should... I'm not even talking about as the Word of God. I'm not even talking about it being infallible, inspired scripture. I'm not talking about them being inerrant. If all you're doing is looking, that you're looking at historical documents, you have every reason to just assume... What this is telling me is correct. Based on every standard of historical kind of um, examination we have, if you're not willing to trust the Bible, that's a level of skepticism that says you can't trust anything we learn from history. Because it's one of the best attested and preserved books and records from antiquity. So... Um, yeah, I've got a few minutes. I'll get into this. This wasn't really part of the original presentation, but okay, people will say, and I've heard skeptics, critics say, okay, fine. So the Bible authors got a bunch of historical things right. They know where cities are. They know the names of people, right? They know different events. Everything is historically and geographically accurate. But do you really expect me to believe in, that they're right about people rising from the dead and walking on water and casting out demons? Right? They say, well, okay, they might have got some historical things right, but the supernatural stuff, are we really supposed to believe that? Because right? there's other documents, right? Hey, the Quran, it gets a lot of stuff right, and it says Muhammad flew around the moon. Are we supposed to believe that Muhammad flew around the moon? Well, here's the thing. There's different ways that you can kind of think about this, but I think that we have to understand that whereas other holy books, they were writing holy books. The purpose of the Quran was to be a holy book. The purpose of the Vedas were to be holy books. Right? These things, the purpose of the Book of Mormon was to be a holy book. They were writing a religious text. The Bible, they weren't writing a religious text. They were writing a biography of Jesus. Or Paul was writing letters to people. These are actual historical documents. The genre, the type of writing it is, they're not trying to be mystical books. They're just writing what they saw. And if what we see here is accurate, that whoever wrote these things had to have been close to the events, they had to have known what was going on, either they personally were firsthand witnesses or they knew firsthand witnesses they got their information from. Okay, so the information is coming from those who knew what was going on, then we're going to have to ask ourselves, they're either right or they're not. So whenever they say Jesus walked on water, that's either right or it's not. And if it's not, you have to ask some questions. You're going to have to explain some stuff. Did they know that they're not right? If Jesus didn't actually walk on water, when the gospel authors said he did, did they know that he really didn't? Well, if they did, then they're lying, and you'd have to explain and establish what are their motives that these people would be deceiving you about these events. And if they didn't know, then they were duped. They were fooled. Okay, we've already established that they were there, that they had very close-up experience and knowledge of these events. So how is it that people who would have been there or would have had the ability to know different got so easily fooled that they included it. And so we end up with three options. Either the miracles actually happened, the Bible authors lied, or the Bible authors were fooled. And no matter which position you take, you have to be able to explain why. So if people are just going to say, oh, they made it up. Really? Show me. Show me your argument. Show me your evidence. Show me your support for why you think they just made it up. You can't just claim it. Uh, famous atheist skeptic um, who uh, argued and debated with Christians quite often, uh, Christopher Hitchens. Um, 
he famously said, anything that is asserted without evidence can be dismissed without evidence. So if someone comes to you and says, believe this, why should I believe it? Well, just because. No, I don't want to. You can just dismiss it. So if someone says, oh, well, the Bible authors, they just made it up. Okay, show me why I should believe they just made it up. Oh, no, no, see, they were fooled. They were conned. They were duped into believing it. Okay, show me why I should believe they were duped into believing it. Make your case. Show me your evidence. Show me your support. Make your argument. Oh, well, how about the idea that, well, it was real. They actually did witness these miracles. Why should you believe that? Well, here's number one. Does God exist? We have every reason to believe he does. That's a whole different talk. We've been over a lot of that before. Well, okay, if God exists, is he capable of doing miracles? Yeah. What's the greatest miracle God has ever done? This is, what's that? Got it in the back, right? Creation. If you can create everything from nothing, right? everything else is child's play. Right? Raising people from the dead, that's nothing. Walking on water, no big deal. Created the universe out of nothing. You can manage that. Right? And so, okay, well, we, we have reason to believe this now. Right? We, we, we have positive reason to believe that God exists and that he's able to perform these miracles and he has a reason to do it. You realize that the miracles in the Bible are grouped, right? If you just think about all the miracles in general, you, it's almost like there's just miracles going on all over the place every day. But it's actually not so. The miraculous events in the Bible are grouped around Moses, Elijah and Elisha, and Jesus and the apostles. There's some other things scattered throughout, but mostly those three time periods is when all the miracles happened. Why? Because there was new revelation to present. There was a new message going on. It was God establishing his relationship with his people and his power and who he was by delivering them from Egypt. It was Elijah and Elisha calling the people back to repentance to follow God by displaying his power in a time when so many were turned against him. It was Jesus and the apostles coming on the scene with the new covenant and a message of salvation through Christ. It was a new message that needed some verification. It needed that seal of, you can believe this. Why can you believe it? Because God's telling it. Well, how do you know God's telling it? Look at the miracles. That's what Jesus said. He said, oh, you, you, you want to believe me? Look at my works. You want to know the validity of my message? Look at what I'm doing. Healing the blind, healing the sick, casting out demons, helping the poor, preaching the good news. He said, look at my works for verification. And so there you have it. This is just, as Dr. McGrew puts it, what we've gone over here is not the tip of the iceberg. It's a few snowflakes on the tip of the iceberg of all of the evidence that is out there for the reliability of Scripture. This doesn't even scratch the surface. So, I'm done. We're actually over time, but any questions?